Hello everybody and welcome to Weeb Revolution with me, your boy, the best boy, the one and only true Eminem. Man, it's good to say that again. I have been absent, hibernating inside my cocoon, but something happened. Something fantastic and magical. A victory so grand that it had to rouse me from my demon slumber. So I'm not gonna waste your time, and I'm gonna get straight into it, because I really want to talk about Bridget. But in typical Eminem fashion, I don't want to just talk about Bridget. I want to talk about more than her. I want to talk about the absolute state of conservative weebs in shambles. I want to talk about reclaiming lost ground, and crucially, I want to talk about the fascinating history of fanboys, the intersection of that history with trans portrayal, and everything that goes with it. A much more thorough dive than I did with the video we published about Ray Zero's Fairs, who is still very much trans, by the way. So, let's get to it. Part 1. Bridget. So, what is this thing even about? You likely heard some rumblings about it, but you may not be aware of what's actually been going on, and nobody can really blame you. Bridget is a character in the Guilty Gear franchise, which is a series of fighting games written, illustrated, and programmed by one Daisuke Ishiwatara. Of course, it's not exactly fair to say all of Guilty Gear is only him, he has a whole company behind him with many talented people, but Guilty Gear is very much his brainchild, and nothing really happens with the series without his direct guidance. To stay brief about this, because this is all historical trivia you can simply look up on your own, Guilty Gear is a series that started in 1998, and as stated before, it's a fighting game series, centering around the mechanical complexity of various playable characters and putting a large emphasis on wacky character design and music, most of which was also composed by Daisuke Shiwatara. Guilty Gear has a long-standing reputation of being completely bizarre, even by Japanese standards, being highly influenced by Western culture for incredible complexity, often resulting in it being hailed as the best fighting game series ever made, and by aforementioned music, which just absolutely slaps. There are people who treat main series releases as a music album with a game attached to it, and it's not an unfair sentiment. Bridget is one of many very colorful characters in the expansive cast of GG Fighters, and she debuted in Guilty Gear X2 in 2002. The naming convention of these games is pretty weird, we're just gonna have to roll with it. As this is a fighting game, the characters, outside of some very plot important, whom Bridget is not, have been given very sparse backstories, sometimes a backstory that amounts to a joke, and their personalities are deduced more from their design, fighting style, and the interactions they sometimes have with other characters before and after the fights, not from voluminous write-ups in obscure weeks, to the chagrin of people who mistake lore for story. In Bridget's case, all you really knew about her for actual, real-life 20 years is that she was born as one of two male twins to a very rich English family that nevertheless had a problem. The village they lived in had a long-standing superstition that two male twins are a very bad omen and would bring terrible misfortune upon their family. So of course, the obvious way to solve this problem was to have Bridget wear girl clothes and be educated by nuns. That's the rationale behind the nun habit. Although the real reason are those western influences I talked about, GG is dripping with pop Christian symbolism the same way that Evangelion does. And no, this is not a joke. Or actually, is it? That's the thing here. You can probably tell that not a whole of a lot of thinking really went into this character initially. In Daisuke's own words, he wanted to have a cute girl character in his fighting game, but he already had another cute girl, so he thought, what if girl, but a boy? No, really, that's the extent of it. This backstory is a thinly veiled excuse to have other characters comment on the fact that Bridget looks like a girl, but they can sense that she's a boy, which sometimes ended up sounding rather creepy and offensive, as in one famous case of Johnny, who is initially very attracted to Bridget, a 13-year-old at the time, only to say, what a waste, when he's made aware that Bridget is a boy. The joke here being that Johnny is gay for being attracted to Bridget. Big yikes, no doubt, but it was 20 years ago. Not much of a consolation, but it's something. 
Initially, Bridget's quest involved leaving the village to become a bounty hunter, learn to act more manly, and become successful in the world to prove the village superstition wrong, as she could sense that her parents felt guilt over their decision to treat her as a girl. Importantly, it was never stated that Bridget was uncomfortable presenting as a girl, quite the opposite. The only discomfort she felt was about her parents' guilt, and the superstition just being silly and surely ruining the lives of many people before her. Though it doesn't seem like the nature of the success she aspired to obtain was set in stone, as on the way to becoming a famous bounty hunter, Bridget also attempted to join a band and worked at a festival. Again, this story has holes, it's supposed to be a goof, not a serious character trauma. Bridget's last appearance before her addition to the somewhat newly released Guilty Gear Strive 2021 was in Guilty Gear XX, 20 actual years ago. I have to stress, for 20 goddamn years, this is all we had on Bridget. A joke backstory and a whole lot of low-key trans misogyny. Not a good start. But Strive changed everything. Part 2. Strive to be the real you. Guilty Gear Strive canonically takes place six years after the events of XX, and at this point, Bridget is a firmly established bounty hunter. She managed to solve the issue of the village superstition and make it a thing of the past. Here is the problem, though. Despite being able to act and present as a man, and despite solving her problem, she didn't manage to find happiness. In Strive, Bridget's story, told in the arcade mode of the game through short interactions with other characters, most importantly Gold Lewis and Kai Kiske, is a deep dive into her own discomfort and what can only be described as an identity crisis. Bridget fights Gold Lewis, who senses something is wrong with her, and she says, I'm a boy wearing girl clothes. It's a long story. Finally, at the end of her character arc, after gaining the courage to be true with her own feelings and being inspired by Kai's conviction, Bridget affirmatively states, with no ambiguity, that she is, in fact, a girl, and not a boy wearing girl clothes. Despite Kai with Goldilux's help, he and Kai affirm that she has people willing to help her in whatever decision she chooses to make, at which point Gold Lewis asks what is the proper way to address her. Happy trails, cowgirl, or, uh, cowboy. Cowgirl is fine, because I'm a girl. And finally, she fights Kai, and after beating him, she asks him for advice on how to come out to others, and says that she's inspired by his conviction. I'm giving you a round though. Again, you can either play the game yourself, which I recommend, it's neat, even if the skill floor is pretty demanding, or you can just watch the whole progression on YouTube. And that's where we are right now. Bridget affirmatively identifies as a girl, making her canonically trans. Of course, that's not all there is to it. There are a lot of other contextual clues to the story, like Bridget's theme song that can only be interpreted as someone struggling with their identity and finally accepting it, an experience shared by many trans people. The trans symbol replacing the previously male symbol in her non-headpiece, and other, more obscure clues like the tone and delivery of some of her lines. This is the minutia of the argument, which, while I'm interested in, we could spend actual hours or even days discussing, which I know, because I have. Now, these are the facts, but as you can imagine, this did not go over well with some people which we'll now have to delve into. So, unfortunate warning, transphobia. With that said, let us tackle... Part 3. The Aftermath. The news of Bridget being trans hit the community like an artillery share hitting a Nazi squadron. What came through the most in the first hours following the discovery was the sheer inability of the transphobes to pick a single line of defense, which massively contributed to the swift victory. Seemingly, they couldn't agree on whether this was a translation issue, a cultural misunderstanding, pandering to the Western audience, a genuine mistake, actually true but meaning something different, or all of the above at the same time. Frankly put, they were confused, demoralized, and routed. Some attempted to jump the gun and wrest control over the narrative, like one hero A, a sort of transphobe here on YouTube, I first attempted to spin a yarn where trans people themselves were against Bridget coming out as trans due to her previous backstory, and when that failed, tried to claim that the Japanese people disagree with this framing by showing random cherry-picked tweets, many of which were not even made by Japanese users. I'm gonna go into greater depths as to why the reaction was so severe, and why Bridget is so important, but in short, it was a total and resounding victory. And the wailing of internet shitlords was a sheer spectacle to behold. 
I ate like a king that day, sustaining myself on pure, concentrated butthurt. So you really missed out if you weren't a part of it. Here I would like to present the bullet points, irrefutable arguments demonstrating that Bridget is trans and cover common misconceptions to each other that have been used as counter-arguments to make a case for Bridget not being trans. Understand that I'm not doing this to have a discussion here? I already had that discussion? It's solved. Bridget is trans. I'm doing this to equip you, the viewers, with arms and ammunition, should you want to wade into the Bridget discourse and have fun poking the transphobes yourselves. So, on with the positive claims, in order of their relative power. Point 1. Bridget affirmatively states that she's a girl in the game. The text is one-to-one -one identical between Japanese and English, and there's no ambiguity here. Further, the game files themselves use female pronouns in reference to her again in both English and Japanese. Point 2. Lesuke Shiwata is famously a huge westerboo. Guilty Gear drips with western influences, so it would be erroneous to claim that Daisuke has a different cultural understanding on trans issues than us westerners would. He's not a clueless mangaka who has never heard of a trans person. Point 3. Daisuke signed a poster with Bridget reading Trans Rights with his name, and was quite enthusiastic about doing so. And yes, he knew what that meant, the significance of the meme was explained to him. Point 4. The English VA for Bridget confirmed on Twitter that the character is trans. Given the hype around Bridget, this cannot be merely discarded as a fluke or one person's interpretation. Rather, it should be seen as directions given to her by the director. Of course, the true great argument for Bridget's transness is just her story and strive, and everything that goes into it. All of her dialogue, more or less obscure clues, the music theme. But talking about that gets you into the minutia of the conversation. And transphobes really love to talk ad nauseum in the hopes of muddying the waters and turning this into a matter of personal interpretation rather than cold, ruthless fact. So I advise against doing that. In my experience, short, quippy and biting bullet points are more painful to them. Now let's tackle the counter-arguments. The big one here is a matter of translation. A very popular claim in the discourse, popularized in no small part by one Dimitri Monroe, has recently become that of rogue localizers, purposefully changing the narrative of Japanese media localized in the US to fit, you know it and say it with me, a vague nefarious leftist agenda. The whole claim really is that evil leftist localizers are trying to bring about communism by denying the weeb's anime pussy. And yes, it's just as unhinged as it sounds. So that is patently false in this case. The text in both Japanese and English is one-to-one -one identical when it comes to Bridget affirmatively stating she's a girl in the game. While her character bio on the official wiki in Japanese omits pronouns, that is simply because Japanese isn't a gendered language like English, and its structure is such that pronouns are simply not necessary. Importantly, Bridget is not the only case here. A lot of other characters' bios also lack pronouns, and nobody is arguing that Faust is trans. Although perhaps I should, out of sheer spite. Additionally, while it's true that the term otokonoko is used in reference to Bridget in the Japanese text, it's not true, as some would assert, that the term exclusively refers to feminine men. I'm gonna go further into the etymology and history of the term in a later section of this video, but for now, know that it is, in fact, an umbrella term that has always and still does include trans women. People claiming that Bridget referred to as otokonoko means she's not trans seem to subscribe to the weird notion that language is prescriptive rather than descriptive. If Bridget is referred to as otokonoko as she is, well, that just means the word now also includes trans women, doesn't it? Since she is one. So don't let a silly word game fool you. The other big one is the notion that Bridget only comes out in the bad ending, and thus her stating she's a girl is not canonical. This is, again, patently false. There are no bad and good endings in Strife. There's no sub-menu in the game where you can see the endings you received and where they'd be dubbed this way. The structure of the arcade mode could better be described as having normal, hard and flawless endings. But even that is a little bit confusing, because one does not attain the flawless ending merely by not losing a single fight, and other than endings by losing a set percentage of fights, but rather by losing very specific fights in the mode, so in some respects the normal ending is harder to attain than the flawless one. 
Additionally, these endings are not contradictory. It's not like in one of them Bridget affirmatively states that she's a manly man-man that just wants to wear girl clothes. It is also not true that the flawless endings are considered canon across the series. By the sheer necessity of how the games are structured, they can't be. Most normal endings have to be canon, and only some, one, or even none of the flawless endings are canon historically. It's important to note that which endings are and which are not canon is not determined in Stry, but will be determined by the next game in the series, as has always been the case, because this is a fighting game. And lastly, this framing of bad versus good endings was never a thing before Bridget, and you can check that for yourself by using the Wayback Machine. Nobody was ever talking about Potemkin's or Axel's bad ending before Bridget came along, so it seems as if, curiously, she's the only one that appears to have a clearly delineated bad ending. The third big counter-argument is that of femboy erasure, and here we're gonna have to go deeper. When it comes to this conversation, feel free to refute this argument simply by stating that femboy erasure is a tariff talking point and move on. Femboy erasure, whatever it's supposed to mean, is not a thing that's happening. It's a boogeyman concocted by transphobes that some are duped into. And there has not been a single identified case of a cis man being bullied by the trans community to identify as a woman. I know, because I repeatedly asked for such cases and found none. However, and there is a however. It would be wrong of me to completely dismiss this specific argument, because as much as I don't like to admit that, I actually have encountered people who genuinely and earnestly believe that Bridget being revealed as trans is a bad direction for the character, and who grieve the loss of what they perceived as an icon. It is, unfortunately, sometimes hard to distinguish the good faith version of this argument from the bad faith version. Fret not though, you can easily identify which people hold the position honestly and which do so dishonestly by which pronouns they use to describe Bridget. If they don't misgender her, but nevertheless feel as though something has been taken from them, you can allow yourself to be charitable, because they just might be telling the truth. It is this fascinating subject that we now have to tackle, the true deep dive of this video. Part 4. What's in a femboy? This is it. This is the big one. Here I would want to go into detail about the tumultuous history of queer representation in Japanese media when it comes to gender non-conforming men and trans women. The majority of the primary source in this is going to be an article 40 years of femboy or a historical explanation of why making Bridget a trans woman is reactionary. Written in August 12, 2022, so this is incredibly new stuff, fresh off the press, cutting edge femboy research, by one The Madman Note, a link in the description. Now, I have to preface this by saying that the article itself is clearly written more as a transphobic screed masquerading as research than anything else. So you may be asking, Eminem, what the fuck? Why are you using this as anything other than toilet paper? And the answer is that, while I vehemently disagree with the conclusion and the framing of the article, the author has, nevertheless, done some serious legwork in archiving the historical instances and evolution of what we'd call femboys. They also managed to clearly delineate and pinpoint the moments in time of the greatest shifts in femboy presentation. Moreover, the article was originally published in Japanese and translated to English, and I was assured that it was written by a Japanese person. While I am skeptical of that, as it certainly does not read as something a Japanese person would write, more like something a Westerner would write and attempt to pass off as native, the term reactionary is a big giveaway, I believe that in this way I can avoid the criticism of only using research that confirms my bias. Well, not really, I'll be criticized this way anyway, but I at least am gonna try, at least I be accused of laziness. Also, I just find it incredibly funny to use sources that ostensibly supposed to make a case against trans representation in Japanese media to demolish that very point. So this is going to be less me citing the article and more me debunking it. I'm just that kind of a spiteful man. So, our story begins in the year 1981, as outlined by our author, with a manga called Stop, Hibari-kun. The titular Hibari is characterized as a man wishing to be a woman, the author, I think correctly, or at the very least I'm willing to grant it as correct for the sake of discussion, points this out as metaphorical ground zero for these types of characters in Japanese media. 
As they themselves note, these characters were initially used for crude jokes, the point of which was to emasculate men who found them attractive. Not unlike Bridget. While these characters were sometimes afforded the courtesy of being tragic, the general zeitgeist was rather unfavorable towards them. Seemingly, they could only be the butt of a crude sexual joke, or a tragic figure that has to live an unfulfilled life or die young. Of course, viewers familiar with the history of queer media in the West will notice that it really isn't that different from how gay and trans characters were treated well into the 90s and in some regards are still treated overseas. So to call this a uniquely Japanese phenomenon is a stretch. Interestingly, the author does admit that these characters should be considered a trans women, as they clearly identify as female. Nevertheless, the author is very quick to cut that curious train of thought short and ends the point by once again pointing out the crude nature of their portrayal, as if slanderous representation was not, in its own way, representation. So not to belabor the point, these characters were trans. Regardless of how inconsiderate and unflattering their portrayal was, there was a kernel of truth in their stories. The struggle of a person assigned male at birth, but genuinely identifying as a woman. These characters would slowly begin to creep into the pages of manga, becoming a common trope. And then, around the 2000s, a shift happened. This is exactly where Bridget falls in. The author describes her debut as a Copernican turn, again, a phrase I would not expect a Japanese person to use, and they are very much right about that. Remember how I said I was going to explain what makes Bridget so important? Well, this is it. Bridget is, in many ways, the beginning of it all, the very first common ancestor from which all of the future fanboys would be derived. The rough and broad cuts of her story became the mold with which future characters like Hayate Ayasaki of Hayate no Kotoku, Mizuho Miyakoji of Virgin in Love her with Her Sister, and Ryo Akizuki of the Idol Master Daily Stars would be crafted. The author is very much not wrong about that. The general theme of a person assigned male at birth, forced to present female, would become a staple, even finding its way to the work of Hidetaka Miyazaki of From Software with the Dark Sun Gwendolyn. This is why the discussion surrounding Bridget is so important. If Bridget is trans, what does that say about all the other characters that followed her? Very importantly, this time frame, the early 2000s, is also the time when the term otokonoko began to circulate in common parlance, although its exact origin cannot be traced. As I mentioned briefly in the video about Feris Aragel, the term can be translated directly as boy-girl, or is sometimes translated as female son. And this, dear viewers, is where our intrepid fanboy archiver cracks wide open. They attempt to infer that a sort of divergent evolution had taken place, that characters established by the likes of Hibari, so actual trans women, went in one direction, while Bridget became a template for a type of a new man, one who most definitely identifies as a man, but who is forced, for one reason or another, to present female. The author is, of course, very wrong about this, but importantly, they didn't even attempt to argue this point really, they just stated as if it was a fact. Those of the same opinion as the author attempt to drive a sharp wedge in the history of queer representation and have co-opted the term otakonoko to only refer to cis men presenting feminine, but unfortunately for them, here is the thing. Bridget was not nearly as much of a Copernican turn as the author claims. In some respects, she was. She did open the proverbial floodgates for these kinds of characters to start popping up everywhere. But it would be wrong to say that Bridget was somehow a breakaway from the history leading up to her. In her presentation, she was very much still used as fodder for crude jokes, like the trans female characters of the past. She was still characterized in mostly the same ways, but she did something amazing. She introduced ambiguity. See, societies that lean conservative have a difficult relationship with art. Due to the overbearing nature of enforced cultural hegemony, they prime their members to look for specific signals and how to identify them, and they instill a visceral reaction to them. The key signal was, precisely, the unambiguous way characters before Bridget identified as women. But with that signal gone, with no stimulus, with only a couple of sentences of essentially comedy to her backstory, Bridget managed to pass off as male. In this way, she was more easily accepted, 
more easily digested by the broader audience. But here's the thing. Otokonoko never stopped referring to trans women as well. You could say that trans representation was merely hibernating, hiding in plain sight, waiting for its opportunity to finally re-emerge. It would be fair to say that a blueprint for a sort of new masculinity has formed, but it is and will forever remain intertwined with trans femininity that informed its origin. It would be wrong to break away from that history, because without it, what shape would this masculinity take? Well... Part 5. The Third Impact Here, the author reaches the final part of the article, where they describe the third wave of femboys. And here is where the reasoning finally goes off the rails and turns into a beautiful, slow-motion symphony of sheer screeching destruction. They once again, surprisingly correctly, managed to identify the next wave of effeminate men in Japanese media, starting around 2007 to early 2010, with Jun Watarase from Happiness. Canonically a trans girl, but the author has by this point veered too far into the weeds to notice or care, and describes them as men transcending gender. The author argues that these men, like the previous generation, starting with Bridget, identify as men, but instead of being forced through circumstance to act feminine, decide to do so out of their own free will. The author sees this as transcending gender, but it should be immediately obvious what has actually taken place here. Namely, the signal has been finally identified and a visceral reaction formed. See, it is not that the author truly sees these characters as transcending gender. If they did, in fact, transcend gender, they would not identify as men, would they? What happened here is that the author went backward and lifted up masculinity to such a high pedestal that it has now been given the right, in an almost divine sense, to also cannibalize a femininity, almost to colonize it, in a really fucked up way. This is the trap people like Dimitri Monroe have fallen into, and should you identify as a gender non-conforming man, I urge you not to follow them into this pit. The rationale here is that what could ever be more manly than a man who is so assured in their masculinity that he can wear girl clothes and makeup without blinking? How could the betas possibly compare to the true manly man man unconstrained by male gender norms, the true sigma, a man truly going his own way? The author wishes to contrast these characters, these transcendent males, yet still males for some reason, with trans women, arguing that to be a trans woman is to merely embrace gender norms still, somehow. A woman is a woman because she has to be one, to be with a man, according to the author, who seems blissfully unaware that trans lesbians exist and have been a part of this entire wretched classification system since all the way back in 1981. To the author, the height of gender nonconformity is seemingly to become the manliest of men, an island on an ocean of gender fluid, entire of itself, entire of its own masculinity. And you can clearly see this play out in the fetishistic aspect of the portrayal of some of these characters. As has been stated many times before, I very much am a self-proclaimed pervert. I am fully aware of how Astolfo is portrayed in Dojins, my dudes. Either as a form of a fetish, appealing to the hyper-masculine idea of denigrating them and turning them into a girl through intercourse, or in hyper-masculine portrayals where it is Astolfo who has the biggest dick around, longer than a kind of monster energy drink, and is the one to do the fucking, often to the dismay of a small-dicked man cuckolded on the side. This is not a healthy view of gender. This is, frankly, batshit insane. I don't have to tell that to our regular viewers, but I do not want to be merely preaching to the choir here. I want to offer something of value to those who are struggling, and I do acknowledge that a whole lot of cis men are struggling. So I would like to address you guys. I want you to know that it is fine to identify as a man and wear skirts. It's fine to be cute, it's great even. What I want to tell you is that the way to your happiness does not lie in pretending that your alpha male energy is so huge that it allows you to wear skirts and makeup without shame. It's not the lack of it either, it's being you. If there truly is a way to transcend gender, and I know for a fact that there is, 
It does not lie in stubbornly affirming your masculinity, and it certainly does not lie in trying to contrast yourselves with trans women. I need you to acknowledge the fact that trans women are the ones who got this ball rolling all these years ago. They have been among you this entire time, and many of you have, or may perhaps will, come to think of yourselves as women. There is no shame in that. But neither is there a nefarious trans pipeline existing somehow as a tool of the broader society to enforce rigid gender norms on you, because as any trans woman will tell you, their gender is absolutely not affirmed by the broader society. Ultimately, whether you believe it or not, what I want is for you to be happy with who you are. You're beautiful, you're valid, and you look lovely in cut ears, bro. I firmly believe that the wedge that has been driven between these communities is an atrocity that we could have maybe even prevented, but failed to do so. But we can work together. But not if you allow yourselves to be poisoned with the idea that me, trans people, or any imaginary shadowy cabal of evil communists is trying to forcibly feminize you. Just as Bridget has managed to finally find herself, I want you to be able to find yourself, by your own choice, truly unconstrained by gender norms. And I hope that that is what you truly want to do. I don't want to run scared anymore if I keep on faking it like this. I know I'll regret it. So from now on, no matter what, no more lying to myself. Part 6. The Future. And that is what I have to say on the matter. I hope I managed to give this topic justice and finally managed to cover the stuff I failed to in my face video. It is my hope that with this increased historical and cultural understanding, we can maybe finally start breaking down the barriers instead of building them. And if we do, it would really be thanks to Bridget and Daisuke, much like it was for the first time 20 years ago. Most importantly, to the gender non-conforming men in the audience, I hope I at least reached some of you. I know you've been struggling, I've had discussions with some of you on the Guilty Gear subreddit, but I saw that a lot of you managed to accept that Bridget is a girl, and I hope she can continue to be an inspiration for you, and it doesn't have to have any bearing on your identity, as she is an inspiring character for me, despite me being a square cis man with very few anxieties about my gender. And to the TERFs and transphobes listening, look, I get it, you lost your damn culture war. Badly. I want you to know that this will continue to happen. One by one we will shatter your infantile delusions, and you're not stopping it. The circle is closing. I do really hope that the existential dread has set in nicely, because I have no charity left for you lot. You're maidenless, and you should feel free to find a ditch to die in somewhere. And to Daisuke Ishiwatara, my man, who is probably never going to hear this, but on an off chance that he does, thank you from the bottom of my heart. You really have always been a trailblazer, and you've done the right thing. In the wake of this, you'll very likely received some angry opinions, possibly even death threats, but I would like you to pay them no mind. From what I've seen, they're mostly coming from angry westerners trying to export transphobia to Japan. You can think of it simply as the west being troublesome again. And to each and every one of you, in equal measure, Heaven or hell? Duel 1! Let's rock! <laughs>